My name is Adriana Link, and I am head of scholarly programs at the American Philosophical Society, Society's Library and Museum. Uh, welcome to today's virtual roundtable discussion with editors Virginia Trimble and David Weintraub on their edited volume, The Sky is for Everyone, Women Astronomers in Their Own Words, uh, that just came out from Princeton University Press in 2022. Uh, we're really glad that so many of you have made time on this beautiful day in Philadelphia and wherever you are to join us for our conversation. I'd like to begin by recognizing that the American Philosophical Society resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose ancestral relationships and connections with this land continue to this day and into the future. Throughout its history, the APS has benefited from residing in this part of Lenape land, now also known as Philadelphia. The APS also wishes to express its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals throughout this continent who have offered their guidance, expertise, and opportunities for collaboration that make the work of the Society's Library and Museum possible. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. Society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge, and election to membership honors those who have made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts, and humanities, and public life. The society promotes research by providing over a million and a half dollars in research grants a year, uh, primarily to younger scholars uh, who need that support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. Uh, please check out our website if you are unfamiliar with us at www.amphilsoc.org uh, to learn more about what we do and also for information about upcoming events. Today's program complements the recent opening of the APS Museum's new exhibition, Pursuit and Persistence, 300 Years of Women in Science. The exhibition explores how women scientists have overcome obstacles to achieve breakthroughs, make places for themselves in science, and help others along the way. For more information on ours and how to visit, please also visit our website. As you've probably noticed and become familiar with, uh, we are using Zoom webinar for today's discussion. So not to worry, uh, everyone has been muted. There's no fear that uh, you will become accident accidentally unmuted and interrupt the conversation. Uh, we do ask though, if you have a question and we hope you'll have many questions that you use the Q&A button at the bottom center of your navigation bar. Uh, you can type your question at any time during today's discussion, and there will be time at the end of the presentation uh, to ask questions to our speakers. We're also excited to continue to offer closed captioning for today's web virtual discussion. And if you'd like to use that during the panel, uh, please click on the CC box on the bottom navigation bar of Zoom. Uh, with that, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce today's speakers. Uh, first, we have Virginia Trimble, who is a native Californian and currently professor of physics and astronomy at the University of California, Irvine, where she is the oldest member of the faculty still on full active duty. Her early astronomical research, including measuring gravitational redshift in the spectra of white dwarf stars, tracing out motions and energetics in the crowd nebula, and chasing down the distribution of mass ratios in various kinds of binary stars in order to understand how they might have been formed. Uh, more recently, she has focused on the history of astronomy and physics, uh, as well as scientometrics. She has held offices and served on committees and societies, including the Working Group on Preservation of Astronomical History of the American Astronomical Society, the Fellowship Committee of Sigma Psi, and the Committee on International Freedom of Scientists of the American Physical Society, as well as the Organizing Committee of the Commission on History and Philosophy of Astronomy of the International Astronomical Union. Uh, joining Virginia is David A. Uh, Weintraub, who is Professor of Astronomy at Vanderbilt University, where he founded and directs the Communication of Science and Technology program and does research on the formation of stars and planets. He is the 2015 winner of the Klopstag Award for the American Association of Physics Teachers, which recognizes the outstanding communication of the excitement of contemporary physics to the general public. His other books include Life on Mars, What to Know Before We Go, Religions and Extraterrestrial Life, How, How Will We Deal With It, and How Old Is the Universe, and Is Pluto a Planet? I think questions we've all wondered in the last decade or so. Uh, he's also he also created and edits the Who Me series of scientific biographies for fifth grade level readers. 
Um, and today they're both here to talk about their book, The Sky is for Everyone. And we generously received a nice discount code from Princeton University Press. So if you're interested in purchasing that book, uh, we'll put a link into the chat as well as the code for you to use. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome uh, David and uh, Virginia, who will share uh, some slides about their book. And uh, again, we invite everyone to put their questions in the chat or in the Q&A at any time. So thank you again, David and Virginia, for joining us. Good evening, depending on what time zone you are in. Uh, good to be with you all. Can I start by asking David, how did you get the idea for the book? I'm pretty sure the idea for the book came when I was on a book tour for my previous book, the Life on Mars book. And I was checking something off my bucket list. I was privileged to give a talk at Griffith's Observatory in Los Angeles. And my host for that meeting turned out to be Laura Danley, who was a classmate of mine, an undergraduate classmate of mine at Yale in the mid 1970s. And in talking with her, I came to realize something I just paid no attention to at the time, which was that she was the only woman in my physics classes. She was the only woman in my astronomy classes. And somehow she toughed it out and made a career out of this. And I tried to imagine how hard that was and I couldn't do it. And I decided I needed to try to understand the history of how women became involved in astronomy over the last half century, because I knew now, before the 1960s, astronomy was not very open to women. So I started down this road and decided that women needed to tell their own stories. And then I realized that I really needed a woman to help me with this and to help lead this project. And I needed someone who was both a, a distinguished astrophysicist and a distinguished historian of astronomy. And there were very few of those people, as in one. And I contacted Virginia and I asked her if she would help lead this with me. And she said, yes. So that's, I think, how we got started. Fair enough. Can I explain the images that you're going to be sharing? Am, am, I'm, like put those I'm, not on, I'm not on screen. Um, I will put them up now. There we go. Well, OK. Um, the images we're going to be sharing are from, from the chapters of the book. As each woman agreed to write a chapter, we asked her to bring to us two photographs, one of herself, of her own choosing, and one that illustrated the science she'd been doing. And we've made, or somebody's made, it wasn't us, I think, University in Lausanne, Switzerland, made the images of the women themselves into a bunch of montages that are some sense classified by what the women are doing in the images, so that we can show that some of them are emphasizing their families. That's the wrong one. That was supposed to say have, this is the seriously, seriously wrong one version. It was supposed to say have supportive spouses because it's the women we're fo focusing on and the husbands that sometimes help them. We, we've got the wrong version of the, of the video. This is a very bad start, but I don't know what to do about it. Okay. Um, David had already located some women who were willing to write. This is Anne, Anne Bosgard on the left, the first woman who observed in her own right at Mount Wilson. And on the far right is um, the first woman who edited the publications of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, Anne Cowley. And in the middle is Gaby Gonzalez with her husband, Jorge Pullen. And she is a spokesperson for the LIGO project. In other words, we've got women who were doing significant things even a long time ago. And who comes up next? Do we have an, a video? Yes, okay. This, in each case, it's either a child or a grandchild. And immediately we pick up something interesting because one of those is Dina Prialnik of Israel. And she uses the name she was born with. She does not share her husband's surname, though he's also an astronomer. And this is an issue that's occurred to me fairly recently, is that there's a sudden break if you look at are 37 chapters, there's a fairly sudden break in time. The, the oldest women, except me, are using husband surnames, and the youngest dozen or so are all using the names they were born with. Dina chose to keep her birth name because her father had no sons, and 
she had no male cousins, so she's keeping the Priolnik, which is Romanian surname alive in Israel. But we also have two other gals with a child or a grandchild, and obviously all very good friends. David, say something. <laughs> Uh, I think that's a, an interesting observation. I actually hadn't thought about that, but it does represent a cultural change among how women uh, started joining the profession and uh, took on professional roles uh, in keeping their own names. There's an issue as well that some of my best friends are carrying with them the surnames of guys they hate. The first husband, they changed their names and they've divorced and remarried and are still stuck with that first name this is advice to everybody don't change your name if you don't have to you might want it back one of our authors uh, who married in the 1960s writes in her chapter about how she was really compelled to change her name and she didn't want to and she tried to change it back and she was told how difficult it would be because she'd have to go to court and she would have to file a tremendous amount of paperwork and she really wanted to keep her own name but it just wasn't what was done in the 1960s at least not very often it was done but only by people who really wanted to and not people living in hawaii that required a name change and in japan that required a name change i think maybe still does What's in our next image? These are women with their students and their postdocs. And most of our 37, not me for the most part, but most of our 37 have handed on their skills to a number of younger scientists where their skills have included observing, calculating things, formulating new ideas. And I think the most difficult conceiving and building new instrumentation, but they do hand on skills. And if I have on skills, I have a bit, but not to not to graduate students. They've been high school students who chose to work with me. And some of them are simply wonderful. And also I'm trying to acquire skills from other people, including the chap who's my technical assistant here. Can you get into the picture, Dan? We need we need to have my camera back on again for a second. I don't know how we do this. Your camera's on, Virginia. We can see him. Okay, um, this is Dan Mickelson. He'll be completing his PhD fairly soon. And he's, he's totally unflappable. I think he has many skills, but he's totally unflappable. He would make a wonderful employee for somebody who's looking for someone with wide computer and electronic skills who's totally unflappable by anything going wrong. Stick your face in the picture again once more. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. One of the things I found compelling in these chapters, and we should note, one of the things we decided on early on with this project is that all of these stories had to be autobiographical. We did not want anybody telling a story about any of these women. We wanted them to tell their own stories. And so we've lost some wonderful women who died fairly recently, like Vera Rubin and Margaret Burbage. Yeah who are unable to contribute, yes. But one of the things that an awful lot of these writers have in common is what we're seeing on this page, their, their passion for teaching and handing on their expertise to the next generation. And many of these women, I think, have worked hard to make sure that they have young women in their cohort of graduate students, postdocs, undergraduates, as we can see from these images. How about the next image? This is Dara Norman, the University of Arizona, and on the far left are the women who attended a meeting in Baltimore some years ago. Um, we tried hard to get authors representing a range of subdisciplines, a range of generations, and particularly a range of ethnicities. We succeeded only moderately well. We have Dara Norman, we have a young lady of color from South Africa now, and two women born in India. We failed, well, we have women with Latinx ancestry, but grown up really in the United States, like Franz Cordova. Um, we failed to find a trans woman who would cooperate. We asked two, one answered and one did not, I think. We failed partly to get senior women from China and Japan. We have two fairly junior women, one from China and one from Japan. Um, we did not do terribly well, but this leads to the fact we want to have a second volume someday with more young women, wider diversity, um, maybe some who did not quite finish PhDs 
and so who don't count as quite as successful. Our 37 all got PhDs. They all were employed or still employed in something like astronomy. We count them as, as the winners. And nobody got topped off like Laura Danley at, at uh, yeah. we, we, we do have authors who were born in about 20 different countries. So in that sense, the book is very international. Uh, but it is also interesting that it's hard to decide whether someone is an international astronomer in this, that sense or is a, an American US astronomer because somebody who was born in Sri Lanka and educated in Cambridge and then takes up a position in the United States later on, are they an American now or are they a, a Sri Lankan or, or what have you? So deciding- All of the above, I think. <laughs> Both of you. We eventually decided not to worry about the international diversity because we thought we had that covered with people born in so many different places around the world. But in fact, having a diversity of women of color was very difficult because in fact, that's a change very recently that very, very few women of color were able to join the profession of astronomy until very recently. The first a black woman to earn a PhD in astronomy earned that in the mid 1980s. So there are you know Williams. Yes. University of Maryland. I knew her well. She was a Frank Kerr student and did a thesis in radio astronomy. Great gal. And in fact, I asked her, tried to ask her if she would contribute a chapter. I think she actually never, she was one of the ones who never answered. I think the struggles that women of color are going through now as really the first generation of women to become professionals in astronomy are mirrored in some of the things the women in the book have written about from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And we're repeating some of those problems or again, moving up the learning curve uh, a second time. And there's a lot to be learned from the stories in the book for the current generation of astronomers coming into the profession. And in fact, for the older astronomers who are helping make that happen, to look back and see what the lessons are from the, the first round of diversifying the profession. Can we have the next image? These are gals who became presidents of the International Astronomical Union unique among the international unions of science and that it has individual members, something like 19,000 now. Anyway, this is Catherine Cesarski and uh, Sylvia Torres Pembert from France and from Mexico. And the current IAU president is, is another woman, but these were pioneers in their own countries, in the discipline and in leadership in the astronomy community. Both also, you know, they're also very nice looking. <laughs> I think it's worth noting the IAU was founded in what, 1919? 1919. 1919. And it right. took nearly 100 years before the IAU elected a woman as president. That's- It's been a while now, actually, since Catherine's. She was already in, in place when we did the International Year of Astronomy in 2005, whatever it was. Whatever it was. But it, it, it's notable- it took a while, that, you put it right, but not forever. It's notable that many leadership positions in astronomy like this were exclusively the domain of men until very, very recently. So this represents a significant change in the last 20 years. Uh, it goes back actually rather further than that. If you look even at the American Physical Society or the American Astronomical Society, that there have been a few women all along, pretty much. Margaret Burbage, Vera Rubin, Cecilia Payne-Gaposchkin, C.S. Wu, a distinguished experimental physicist, was a president of the American Physical Society a long time ago. She got a postage stamp fairly recently. She looks very nice on the postage stamp, too, though she's no longer with us. But I would note those were the exceptions rather than the rule. And now there's more um, or equity. I think there are like four presidents of the American Astronomical Society in a row now have been women, including Kelsey Johnson, the, the current one. Um, how about the next image? What do these gals do, David? Well, again, they these women represent major leadership uh, 
changes in astronomy. Gabby Gonzalez was the spokesperson for the LIGO project. Uh, Sarah Seeger leads a, a major effort in developing uh, a future telescope for NASA that will search for, well, will study exoplanets and search for atmospheres around those planets. Uh, Roberta Humphreys was one of the leaders who put together the women, first woman, women in astronomy uh, uh, organization that was put together in 1972 by the American Astronomical Society to try to understand how women were being treated in astronomy and what changes could and should be made to change the profession. Many things had to go right for most of us. I was about as lucky as anybody could have been, I think, in choice of parents, which is terribly important. And you don't know you're choosing your parents when it happens. Choice of spouse is also terribly important. But nothing bad ever happened to me. I, I went straight through from <laughs> Toluca Lake Grammar School, Lecount Junior High, Hollywood High School, UCLA, Caltech. When I arrived on the Caltech campus, apart from secretaries, there were 14 women on the entire campus from a first year graduate student like me up to Professor Olga Towski Todd, a very distinguished mathematician. And it was years before she got a professorship. But, you know, the barriers fell as we were coming along. Women for a long time were not allowed at Caltech or Princeton. They are now. Women were not allowed to observe at Mount Wilson and Palomar. Um, and Bozgard made it to Mount Wilson. I made it to Palomar, the second woman assigned time in my own right. The barriers just fell before us. And the pro I think the problems now have to be more subtle, more different. They're not the formal rules that they used to be. Uh, but the, the problems for women, I think, are still there. But I think you're right. They're more subtle. And you know, as, as women take up these kinds of leadership roles, they knock down more barriers. But the mm -hmm. women in our volume are the ones who have been knocking down those barriers and trying to figure out how you can be a leader on these major international uh, projects as a woman. Can we have the next image? Some of our women are actually very good at other things. <laughs> this is Priya Natarajan sculling on the Cam River in, in England. And I think the other one's a skiing image, is it? Uh, this is Poonam Chandra. Uh, bungee jumping in the Alps. The Swiss oh, okay, Alps. yes. So our women can be very good at some things besides doing science. In fact, that's that would be an interesting thing to. There are several things we could do statistics just on the book we the chapters we have, and more people should do statistics on these things. How many women also exceed at something else? Some of them mention having been very fond of music. That's characteristic, I think, of men scientists as well. That. Many of them are also violinists, pianists, and so forth. Cecilia Payne was a very fine violinist, by the way. Um, but it would be interesting to pick up how many women are really very good at more than one thing, as many men are, I'm sure. <laughs> What's the next? Yes, next image. What are these gals doing, David? Well, they do something which I have no ability to do. Uh, these are women who are good at building instruments or helping get telescopes running. So Judy, Judy Pfeiffer, who is at Cornell for her career, uh, designed infrared detectors. So the little widgets that go inside cameras that we attach to telescopes to detect infrared light. And she really is one of the pioneers in developing infrared cameras and infrared detectors. Uh, Saiko Hayashi has worked at a number of telescopes, making sure that as those telescopes are built, they work. So one of the telescopes she worked at early on in her career was called the JCMT, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii. And she spent much of her time out there climbing on the rigging, you know, many meters above the ground, trying to help make sure the shape of the telescope, all the little pieces that went together to make the telescope were properly aligned so that the telescope would work. She then worked on the, the Subaru telescope, a Japanese telescope, which is also in Hawaii. And now she's on the team to build the 30 meter telescope, the TMT. 
if we can figure out where to build it. <laughs> if it gets built. Yeah. And the third one? And Yilin Gomez Macau Chu uh, is responsible for getting this telescope working in Mexico, the Saint X telescope, which is the first telescope in Mexico dedicated to searching for and studying exoplanets. Is that at Saint Pedro Martyr? It's, I don't know. I'd have to look in the chat. I, I think it is. Um, it's but a very, very good site, which is going to stay dark for economic, it's, it's, uh, it's in Baja, California. It's going to stay dark for economic reasons, but it is prone to contrails from San Diego airport. And this is an issue that's going to affect many observatories, along with the streaks of satellites for communication that are going to turn up in Hubble Space Telescope images, as well as ground-based. Um, I, I suspect in a generation, most astronomy will probably be done from space or the backside of the moon. Because it's got to be done from fairly high orbit as well, or you, you still encounter those satellites. But at least right now, for a few more decades, telescopes on the ground will be essential for astronomy. And we have a number of women who wrote chapters in the book who have tremendous skills in building instruments and designing telescopes and making telescopes work. And they they tell their stories and their work in doing that. Can we have the next image? Because it shows, I think, yes, that most of us, most of the time, have been fairly happy with what we've been doing. That's Grazina Kautvans of, of uh, Lithuania, center back. And you've seen a couple of them before and a couple you have not. That's Rosie Wise. Um, we enjoy mostly, and uh, Netta Bacall, mostly we enjoy what we do. And I think that's a big part of succeeding in the end. If you if it doesn't make you happy, maybe try something else. Is that good advice? I think that's probably pretty good advice. And certainly becoming a professional astronomer is hard enough to do that. It's probably not a good career choice unless you're absolutely certain you want to go down that path. But that was, what, that was what Cecilia said you know, generations ago. Do astronomy only if nothing else will satisfy you, because nothing else is probably what you'll get. <laughs> it turns out not to be true, but it, it was almost true for her. Um, but for some of these women, getting to where they are was very, very difficult. Right? Yes. And again, their stories in the book, some of them were quite moving in how the difficulties they had to overcome in order to get their educations, in order to get professional appointments. But I was actually surprised at how many of our authors did not have those kinds of significant problems. And I, I was pleased to learn that from their stories. But nevertheless, it, there was a, a good balance in quite a few of them had no major barriers they had to fight through and had fairly uh, smooth paths in their careers, and others had very, very difficult paths. So Nada Pakal, who I think has been very happy in her career, had a hard time getting a faculty position at Princeton for a long time, and she ended up working at the Space Telescope Science Institute uh, down the road and was essential in designing the, the guest observer program for the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, but she had to work at long distance from where her husband was located for a number of years before Princeton was willing to give a faculty position to a second one. But she made good use of her time on the train working, and she was wonderful at Space Telescope. The one year we had Matza during Passover was the year that Netta was in charge of the uh, time assignment committee. <laughs> well, Netta uh, was the second woman appointed to a faculty position at Princeton. Uh, and you know, that was in 1989, I believe. Would you claim Jill Knapp was the first? I mean, her status there was dubious for a long time as well. Jill Knapp was the first woman to have a faculty position in astronomy at Princeton, and both of them have chapters in the book. And they both came with husbands who were they, they, primary they were. appointments, John Bacall and Jim Gunn. Which and is an Jill interesting... Jill Knapp is one of the people stuck with the surname of a husband that she hasn't seen for a very long time. It's an interesting part of the story, which becomes evident when you read enough of the chapters and look at the history of astronomy. But a lot of the women 
who gained faculty positions in the 1970s into the 1980s did so in part because the universities needed to solve the two-body problem. They were hiring the husband and they needed to also provide a position for the spouse. And all of them were eminently qualified to be hired in their own right, but universities weren't hiring women on their own then. Can we have the next image? It turns out that there are multiple solutions to the two career problem. I was married for 28 years to Joseph Weber, who's professor of physics at the University of Maryland. And I was here at Irvine. So we shared our appointments. We spent January to June in California and July to December in Maryland each year for 28 years. It worked well. Nobody else has ever done that. Meanwhile, however, some of our women colleagues have been winning some very impressive prizes. And here they are in groups in presentations that go with winning those prizes. Yeah, you'll notice in the picture at the left, you'll have to search hard until you find the one gal. <laughs> She's in the third row from, from the front, right? Not near the left. Yeah, third row from the bottom, second person from the left. And the next image. Yes, these are women who have had significant roles in government. Franz Cordova was a chief scientist at NASA. She was director of the National Science Foundation. She now, I think, runs a foundation that attempts to bring private money to bear on public problems. And she still answers her own email. And she was the one who invited me to be at the presentation when the LIGO people announced the first detection of gravitational waves. Branch Cordova has an interesting backstory that she writes about in her chapter. She received her undergraduate degree from Stanford in English. Yes, and, and worked in Mexico learning Spanish and Zapotec. <laughs> and she writes beautifully, truly beautifully. To read her chapter is, is just a joy because it's so beautifully written. But she received an opportunity to be a writer for a magazine after graduating. And she was in New York writing. Uh, and she was sent up to Boston to learn about and to interview some people uh, in astronomy. And that's how she ended up learning about the work of Jocelyn Bell Burnell and her discovery of neutron stars. And when she learned about that, she decided, I think I want to do astronomy. So she came to Caltech. So a perfect earned a PhD in astrophysics at Caltech after earning a bachelor's degree in English. It's a very unusual path. Well, like I said, many of our gals are good at more than one thing. Next so, image. Yeah. These are all gals who've been observatory directors, or some still are. Catherine in the middle there. There's Jocelyn Bell Burnell with the radio telescope with which she in some sense, discovered pulsars. That they were neutron stars required interpretation by some other people, but that she recognized a strange radio signal is not in doubt. And the far right is uh, Anila Sargent of Caltech, who was director of the radio observatory there for a long time. These pictures show something very interesting, I think, and that is how different radio telescopes can be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> On the right behind Anila Sargent are these enormous dishes from the Owens Valley Radio Observatory, and behind Jocelyn Bell Burnell are a bunch of wires on sticks. They're dipoles, I believe. <laughs> that was the Lord's Bridge Radio Observatory in Cambridge, directed for much of its history, much of its early history at least, by um, Martin Ryle, who shared the Nobel Prize with Anthony Hewish. Hewish's prize was for the discovery of pulsars. Jocelyn did not share that. But in the intervening years, she's won an enormous number of well-deserved awards. He's actually won very little after the Nobel Prize. People worried about the inequities and tried to, tried to reduce the inequity of her not sharing the Nobel Prize. The person who benefited most from that, of course, was Joe Taylor's student. Yes, in the early 1990s, Joe Taylor had a graduate student who helped him with the discovery of uh, binary binary pulsars again i think 
it, 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 Russell Holson, I think honestly, the student was the one who recognized that something interesting was happening and forced the professor to pay attention and was duly rewarded for it. What's in our next image? Oh, yes. That is indeed Jocelyn as president, I think, of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And Wendy Friedman, who participated in the recognition of large scale structure in the distribution of galaxies in the universe. A very hot topic now, the very large scale structure of the universe and how it's evolved with time is a major topic now. Is, it some, is that something you're interested in, David? Uh, the large scale structure of the universe? Yeah. I'm interested in it, but I haven't done any work in that field. Okay. But I think that's one of the major activities in astronomy now. That and exoplanets, honestly, I think is. Yeah, those are the two. So if yeah. I were a young astronomer, I would pick one of those two directions to go in. No, pick what's going to be the next hot topic. That's much harder. I was well, very lucky to have done a thesis on the Crab Nebula just before the discovery of pulsars. <laughs> That turned out to be a real winner. It wasn't our thesis advisor had not intended that. Guido Munch had two sets of plates of the Crab Nebula. He thought one was very interesting. He gave that to Jeff Scargill. He thought the other was boring and gave it to me. He was wrong. Well, I think as a young graduate student, most young graduate students will need to be supported by a faculty member's research grants. And those research grants right now are probably most of the time going to be either related to exoplanet research or large scale structure of the universe research. Sure enough, there are there are still honest to God individual fellowships from NASA from the NSF, um, not vast numbers compared to the numbers of students, but students can get fellowships that allow them to choose their own advisor and their own topic. And we'd like to think they're the most creative students that may not be true, but we'd like to think they are. Last image. Sometimes, Actually. yeah, sometimes astronomers edit books. <laughs> That's me as a graduate student measuring proper motions in the Crab Nebula with what was then the state of the art measuring device. Have you measured plates, David? <laughs> Only when I was an undergraduate. Were there yeah. women undergraduates with you then? Are you still I, I, Lord, I, Lord yeah. I probably used as an undergraduate some of the images that you published of the Crab Nebula to make measurements and try to reproduce measurements you had made to see if I could actually calculate something worthwhile. And, and I, use, I use the raw data to set up some laboratory experiments at the University of Massachusetts my year at Smith College. So it wasn't it wasn't all wasted. I think I think that's important. I found somebody quite recently who recognized dark matter in a radio rotation curve well before Vera Rubin got into the game. And his data were not wasted. They just weren't published in a way that people understood. David Rogstad, but nothing you learn is wasted. There's no such thing as useless knowledge. There's no such thing as wasted learning. And pay attention to what's going on around you because someday you'll be the only one who remembers. <laughs> That's not funny. That's a serious remark to students who are in classes, going to conferences, doing their first research, pay attention to what's going on. But well, one of the things you did at about the time this picture was taken or early, slightly before, was Hollywood related with the Twilight Zone. Yeah, right. <laughs> I tell everyone about that. I think that's an interesting part of your story. Well, I appeared in, in Life Magazine as a rep representative undergraduate at UCLA. Um, and it was a nice, they're nice photographs still to be found on the web and they belong to me. Um, but as a result, somebody saw that photograph at Rogers and Cowan, a publicity agency, and had the bright idea of my touring all the Nielsen cities as Miss Twilight Zone to advertise the last, the last year of new Twilight Zone programs written, by, many of them written actually by, by Rod Serling, all of them chosen by him, many of them written by him. And so I have a nice photograph of me with Rod Serling pretending to review a, a script for a television program. But I visited the Nielsen set cities, Houston, Dallas, Chicago, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, New York, Boston, Washington, Cleveland, San Francisco, LA, and did morning wake up shows, television broadcasts, quiz programs, um, 
newspaper interviews, it brought in enough money to cover, I did this my second year in college, I brought in enough money to cover registration and stuff for the rest of my college career. And did you learn any skills from doing that that applied to your career in astrophysics? I'd already learned those skills at Hollywood High School. If you aren't sure of the answer to a question, start by repeating the question in the hopes that by the time you get to the end of the first sentence, you'll remember the, the sec, what the sentence, second sentence should be. Um, seriously, how to respond to questions, how to say yes if you possibly can agree to do something. I mean, I said yes to this book without really thinking, am I going to spend the entire Christmas vacation indexing? And yes, we did that. We did, we did our own indexing over Christmas vacation, didn't we? We did. We did. And it's a long... It was it's a, a long, long index. We, we, a lot of names in the book. We made the right choice. It's a much better index that I'm going to get on the book that's coming out pretty soon from a different publisher. But we made the right choice. But never say no if you think you can possibly do it. Even if it's a future commitment to something you aren't quite sure of, say yes and try. I have to say I was very impressed at how many of the women we invited to write chapters actually said yes. I think we extended 49 invitations and 39 of those women said yes. And 37 of the 39 eventually actually submitted a contributed chapter. I think that was a, a very high uh, positive response rate. And the chapters are marvelous and they're all so different. Some of the women wrote a lot about the science they did. All of them wrote at least a little bit about the science they did. So when you read the book, you learn a fair amount of astronomy and you learn about a number of different areas of research in astronomy. But you also learn the personal backstories of a lot of people from a lot of different parts of the world, which is, is marvelous. I, I just love reading the chapters and having the privilege of helping get those chapters into the book. I actually learned a fair amount from the chapters written by the women who'd been fellow graduate students at Caltech. <laughs> now, I, we I, all have very different experiences, even from the person who's sitting at our elbow. Exa well, exactly right. We, we, shared an, we shared offices, you know. Nevertheless, it was different for everybody. And it happened, un entirely happy, I think, for me, but mostly happy for Anila. Not always so happy for Judy Cohen. We're now all widows. I'm going to stop sharing the screen because I think this is the last slide. This is the last slide, yes. Hi. <laughs> and then we're back. We're back. There and may I, be maybe some questions. Time when Andrea would like to turn over to discussion or questions, yeah. Yeah, no, this is, I, I've actually really enjoyed sitting and listening and, and kind of reliving um, Virginia, your experiences and, and David, yours as well. Um, and I, I've jotted down a, a number of questions to, to maybe pose to you uh, after this presentation, but invite others who are, who are with us. If you have any questions, please do feel free to put them in the Q&A. We still have a little bit of time. Um, I, I guess to, to start, I would love to kind of hear more about the process of putting this together. I, I love this approach of asking the women that you, you, you invited to be part of this to submit to photographs. And, and, and I guess I have a lot of questions around that, but I'm wondering, what do you plan to do with the photographs now that they've appeared in the book? Are you, are you going to create some sort of repository for them that, that's publicly available or, or, or archived somewhere? Um, and, and then also just how long did this whole process take you uh, other than indexing over Christmas? <laughs> it took like a year and a half, I think. But um, the photographs as they appear in the book are not wildly good quality. I think an archive, if you want an archive, buy the book. If you want. <laughs> I think it took from the date we wrote our first letters of invitation to women to contribute chapters until we finished the index was about two years. Okay. You, start, you, started, you already invited, what, maybe 10 women before I came on board. Well, I had asked them if they would, if we did the project, but then we had to accept If you are invited, would you say yes? yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I had done that first step, and that, that actually was a whole year of effort before we found a publisher and, and formally got started. I didn't think we could 
ask a publisher to commit to the project unless I knew we had enough women who yeah. would contribute to the project. This was a bit of a chicken and the egg problem, but it worked. I asked it, about 13 women and 12 of them said yes. And 11 of them wrote, I think. <laughs> and that allowed us to go to Princeton University Press and say, we are pretty certain that if you allow us to invite you know, 40 women, we'll get 30 contributed chapters. And Princeton Press did their calculations and said, yeah, we want about 30 chapters. So but, we, we wrote too much. <laughs> But over time, we managed to nudge that number upwards. So we ended up with 37 chapters because we had a statistics problem. How many yeses will we get if we ask 35 people or 40 people aiming to get 30? Admitting and, people to sure. a graduate program has the same problem. But actually, I think our introduction is somewhat longer than any one chapter. Yeah, because we, we, we wrote our own introduction on the history of women in astronomy. Yeah. There's no groundbreaking work there, but we put a lot of information together in one place on women in astronomy before the time when our authors were active. So that's chapter one. And we missed some of the French gals with PhDs that I've only just found recently hunting for some. Your most interesting discoveries are always made when you're hunting for something else, right, David? Right. You bump into things. When we extended the invitations, we asked the women to do two things. We asked them to write in part about their backstory, how they got into astronomy, and if they had any hurdles to jump, we invited them to write about those hurdles, but we didn't demand that they do so. Uh, we weren't trying to create a book that just detailed problems that women had in astronomy, but we also asked them to write in part about their science, but we did not give them any instructions beyond that on how to balance it. We wanted them to be creative in telling their story in their own way, and some of them were very open in presenting lots of background, and some wanted to focus more on the science. And I think I was asked to write my chapter as a sample to be sent out, Princeton thought, and then you or they decided not to share it in advance. So I wrote mine in an afternoon. Yeah, you wrote yours first, and then we collectively decided that maybe we shouldn't influence the authors by giving them some kind of template to work with. Well, virtually so, all but two or three start with being born. Yeah, most well, of them don't know where they were born and they're- yeah, But I start in medias race. Their, their preschool, their high school education. I actually was fascinated to, to read about the issue of role models or mentors. And Virginia and I have talked about this a bunch, that many of them. Yeah, those are two very different. A role model is when you say, she did that, I can do that. And for better or for worse, the gals that I met in, this, in astronomy ahead of me, I have not achieved any of their accomplishments. It's Maude Makemson, Cecilia Payne-Kaposchkin, Eleanor Margaret Burbage, Vera Rubin, and Beatrice Tinsley. Every one of them did something more important than what I've done. So as role models, it was a whole, it was a total failure. But so many of these women, and I realized it for myself as well, had important teachers mm -hmm. in middle school, in high school, in their undergraduate years, who inspired them, who encouraged them, who convinced them that they indeed could have careers in science, even though that was not common for, for girls at the time to think in those but, terms. But quite a lot of them say in their chapters, and I've heard it many times from other people, I don't want to be a teacher. That was not... The teachers may have been what inspired them, but it was not a role model. That was not what they wanted to do was teach middle school or high school. <laughs> That's right. They weren't necessarily trying to become teachers, but their teachers showed them that it was possible to do something other than be a nurse. I don't want to disparage nurses. That's not what I'm trying to do. But careers in STEM were not obviously possible for a little girl growing up in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s. And things began to change, I think, in the 80s. If you say so. So I, 
mean, I always knew I was going to go to graduate school and be a scientist. There was no, there was never a, an alternative. And I was born in 1943. But you were unusual. Well, I think the other 36 are all equally unusual. <laughs> Andrea, so this, so is, this is an interesting. This is an interesting point and something that we explore uh, in the current museum exhibition that, that just opened at the APS last week, which is really um, uh, emphasizing the importance of these, these networks and these connections and, and these communities uh, of, of influences and, and folks uh, in women in science more broadly. And, and maybe we can share in the link uh, the, the visualization that our, our Center for Digital Scholarship uh, put together are really connecting um, the, the central work that, that Florence Sabin did uh, in, in writing letters of reference for, for women um, across the life sciences and, and kind of building their careers. So uh, the, the two of you as, as professional astronomers who are now kind of reflecting and writing about the history of your, your field, other than kind of really recognizing the importance of these networks, are, are there other, other kind of lessons that, that you've learned uh, about uh, your own careers, your own experiences, but also about the history of the discipline writ large? Sort of. Uh, there's an International Union of Pure and Applied Physics, which has an astrophysics commission, which I chaired. As IAU has presidents for everything. The IUPAP has chairs. I chaired the Astronomy Commission. And as we came into the next triennium, people kept asking me, we need an astronomer from Lithuania. We need an astronomer from Spain. We need an astronomer from South Africa. And could you provide a suggestion? Funnily enough, I suggested women for all of these countries. You, you, you actually saw uh, my, my Lithuanian gal, Grzyna, in one of those pictures. And they mostly then represented their countries on this commission, the next triennium. And the then IUPAP president, who shall remain nameless, said, too many women. Actually, worse than that, he said, too many women, because he was French. We were, our commission was half women. It hasn't happened before or since, but he said too many. One of the things I learned from the chapters is that by the time I was moving into the profession, applying for jobs, there were actually ways to do that. The, the American Astronomical Society had a job listing. Job register, yes. The single but, most important diversity, including yeah, enhancing but, thing in the, in the entire community, I think. But we hear from the women in their chapters who were finishing their PhDs in the 1960s and the early 70s, no such job registry existed. No application system existed. It was all the old boys network. And it literally was the old boys network and several of them label that way. And their professor would call their friend at Yerkes Observatory and say, hire my graduate student. And that's how people got jobs. Mm -hmm. And the women weren't part of that network and had a much, much harder time landing positions. Perhaps I was lucky that my thesis advisor badly wanted me to leave Southern California. So he helped you find a, an opportunity. Oh, yeah, no, I, I was recommended to a number of places. This was just the tail end of the glorious days of Sputnik and all. And I had, you know, five job offers when I left graduate school and another five when I came back to the US from Cambridge. But he really wanted, he really wanted me to leave Southern California. I That's think the whole process argument in, in favor of having an, in, an improper relationship with your thesis advisor. I think the whole process of searching for, applying for jobs is an enormously positive change in Absolutely. all the professions. Absolutely. To make more equitable. I think there's some parts of science where that still doesn't really happen. Astronomy has been for far-sighted in this for one reason well who was it who started the job register for double as do we know i do not know i don't know when it was and i do not know i just know it was there it was there when you came nine when i was applying for jobs i think it might actually have been steve Marin. we could ask but that somebody had this idea and it took some years to get fully off the ground where all places that had a job to offer shared including not in the u.s it covers now jobs in other countries fairly well. But somebody had that idea. You have another question for us? 
Yeah, I think we're we're slowly running out of time, unfortunately, because I feel like we could we could talk for another half an hour. Um, but but did want to ask you. Oh, let's see if we. Okay, uh, I did want to ask you just since you did mention that you are uh, preparing or, or thinking about writing a sequel to this volume, I wanted to ask you um, what what you see as sort of the needs and opportunities in, in terms of writing about women in science and, and maybe things that, that you mentioned uh, increasing the diversity as one area that you'd like to improve upon in terms of the first volume. But are there other sort of needs and opportunities that you see in the ways that narratives about women in science have both been produced uh, in the past and, and, and how, I, how we might learn from them going forward in, in telling these stories? Younger and people who didn't quite succeed. I think people need to see people like themselves in professions, and we have not fully captured. And refuse to be bald and bearded. <laughs> there are, we have a lot of diversity in the book, but not as much as we would have liked. We tried, as Virginia said, to have a, a more representative group of people, but it was very, very hard to find because the profession is not that diverse yet. And As you grow younger, it's going to be easier. I, I realized out of, out of the chronological bin, we could have asked Rebecca Oppenheim. We, if we do a second volume, we certainly should. She started life as Ben Oppenheim. But she's probably only about 10 years past PhD now. I think doing a second volume is a great idea. We would both love to do it, whether it's feasible, whether the publisher will want to do it, those are different questions. But we think it would be good to have more people tell their stories. Uh, and that could be more astronomers tell their stories. It could also be other professions doing something like this with right. volumes like this. Chemistry, you get more people going into, in, well, we have astronomers who've gone into industry and we have tended to call them as not successful, quote unquote, but chemists more than half go into industry. And that's an, a very different path and a very different lifestyle, I think. Well, it's very clear to me from this conversation that there's a lot of work still to be done um, and a lot of conversations to be had between scientists, folks who have, have been living um, the history of the fields, as well as historians who have worked and, and, and you know, museum curators and others who are telling these stories, that there's more conversations to be had and, and the possibilities for, for telling the stories, not only of women of science, but, but all folks who haven't yet had their stories shared um, from these collections, that there's more work to be done. So I guess I'll, I'll just, um, and by saying thank you um, for, for doing the work to, to share the stories of the women who you do have in this volume. Thank you to them for sharing their stories with you. And um, I hope that everyone who's on the call uh, has a chance to um, come and visit us at the APS to take a look at the exhibition. Um, there's gonna be more programming related to women in science um, throughout the year, so more to come. And um, Thank you, David. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you especially for all of your contributions as, as a woman who's navigated this field and um, for, 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 for serving as a role model <laughs> in your own right. So. It's a real con con a contrast. Lots of gals can do what I've done. Not so many could do what Margaret Burbage did. Well, thank you for having us on thank the program. Thank you for having us, yes. Stay well. Thank you, you as well. And take care, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye.